Beloved in the Lord, um, I greet you this morning with love, and I pray that God will, through his word, bless you today. Amen. It is, I'm filled with joy this morning, and I'm filled with joy because of what God is doing in the lives of people. Bible says that if one soul repents, the whole heavens rejoice. So we don't, have, we don't need one million souls to repent for heaven to be happy, but only one soul. It doesn't mean that we don't have to really go after one million souls, but it means that we have to go after the one million souls, but we have to be uh, um, conscious of that one soul as well. And when we see one soul yield to the Spirit of God, we need to all rejoice and continue to bless them, help them so they can stand. It's not easy to walk this life. It's not, but we know that God is with us and He is really helping us to continue to progress. Amen. Amen. This morning, I believe that God is really uh, asking me to share this with you. And um, the, the theme is very simple. It's a very popular theme. It's a very popular scripture in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. And uh, I call it, to obey God is better than offer a sacrifice. To obey God is better than offer a sacrifice. Bible says that, but Samuel replied, that the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Why this? Because God is speaking to me in a lot of ways. We have tried as much as we can to really turn things around in the church. He's saying that obedience is better than to offer a sacrifice, which basically means that one comes after the other. One is much of a higher priority than the other. It doesn't mean that we don't have to make sacrifices or we don't have to offer or we don't have to. But we need to really do it the right way. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I, I believe that we, we are all overwhelmed with uh, sowing, reaping, and all kinds of things that we hear. Uh, I, I, um, um, when God was really bringing this to me, I remembered one time someone here in this church really complaining bitterly that uh, she gave her all, but God has not really blessed her. And um, it's like I sowed my seed, I gave uh, to the Lord, but do- the Lord has not been faithful in giving back to me. And I feel many of us probably might be feeling the same way, that we've been giving, but we're not receiving anything. And therefore, it is important that we understand what God is saying to us this morning. Amen. Um, I believe in the principle of uh, um, sowing and reaping. I believe in that principle because I'm a farmer and I'm an agriculturist. So I understand that when you sow, Definitely, your expectation is that it will do what? It will grow and it will bear you fruit. So, and uh, there are certain seeds when you sow, uh, in a very short period of time, you will reap. But there are others that will take years. I can give you a typical example. If you plant tomatoes and if you plant cocoa, tomatoes will give you tomatoes in three months, but cocoa will give you yields in three years. So definitely, there's a difference there. And therefore, the fact that when we sow and we reap is true. It also, we need to also understand that the timings must be, might be different. Amen. But also, according to the Bible, (laughs) it is not every seed you sow that bear fruit. You don't like that one. I said, according to the Bible, not according to me, not, not according to agriculture, but according to the Bible, 
not every seed that you sow will bear fruit. Some seeds will not yield anything. Amen. Amen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Hallelujah. From verse 1. I'm not going to read all because I just read, I'll read verse 1 and then I'll go to, I think, 19 and then read a little bit there for you as well. Amen. Um, because I just want you to get an idea of what I'm trying to say. That will help you in your walk with the Lord and in how you want to manipulate God. Amen. Because many of us are trying to manipulate God. But you see, God is wiser than you and me. And therefore, no man can manipulate him. You can try, but you fail miserably. Amen. Okay. That same day, Jesus went out, to the, out of the house and sat by the lake. No, go on. Yeah. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in uh, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. A farmer went out to sow his seed. Now, you know the story, so I'm not going to go on from there. But I'm going to really go to 18 uh, so we can look at what happened to the seeds that were sown. Amen. Okay, go to verse 18. Listen to, then to what a parable of the sower means. Hallelujah. Okay. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So, the, what you need to understand is that that seed was sown. But it did not yield anything. Sometimes the seed you sow is eaten by the devil straight away. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 20. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they are, have no root, they are not solidly grounded. They, 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 they don't have meat. They have bones. Hallelujah. They last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Hallelujah. They don't bear fruit. Amen. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. It also was unfruitful. It didn't bear fruit. But all these seeds were sown. All these seeds, I said, were sown, yet unfruitful. Okay. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. It bore fruit. Out of the four seeds that were sown, only 25% were fruitful. 75, nothing happened. Hmm. Not that they didn't sow. Not that those seeds were not sown. They were sown. Yet, they did not bear any fruit. Why? The soil was not good. <laughs> Beloved, we're talking about obedience and sacrifice. We turn things around and we are all seeking worldly things, earthly things, and therefore our minds are fixated on what we can get. And therefore, what we want to hear is not how to live a holy life, but how I can sow, so I can reap. 
But remember, 75% did not yield anything. You are my children. So I have to really tell you what God is saying. I should tell you. God is saying that we have turned things the other way. Now we don't care about obeying God's word, but we want to sow. We don't want to... (laughs) Let me ask you. Hallelujah. Which one comes first? To take your bath or to pomade? Before you pomade? Okay. All right. Okay. I hear you. So why is it that people want to permit before they take their bath? What? Polish on death. Okay, all right. Hallelujah. Yeah, we can give it names. Many of us are carelessly giving. Many of us are carelessly giving, thinking that we can manipulate God for him to give to us. And we carelessly quote his word back to him. Yeah, but did you not say that if I do this, you will do this? Yes, he said it. But as you quote back to him, quote the other ones as well. That he doesn't accept the sacrifice of the wicked. Which means that when you are coming to give him a sacrifice, you have to check your own life. We cannot manipulate God. And we cannot force God to do things for us. So many people are complaining, but I go to church. I have done this. I have done that. Fine. It's, it's good to go to church and it is go, good to give. But don't give carelessly. Don't give under compulsion. Don't give because somebody is pushing you and forcing you to give. Hallelujah. If you let someone force you to go to the farm and sow your seed, you will not sow it well. Birds will eat it. Many of us, in fact, the the seeds we sow, the sacrificial seeds we are sowing, they are eaten by birds. Hallelujah. And if birds eat it, The truth of the matter is that it is digested. So it doesn't bear any fruit. Hallelujah. If you sow in rocky ground, it doesn't doesn't grow to have good roots because there is no depth. And when that happens, you realize that it scorches. When the sun uh, shines, it scorches. You don't get anything. And if you sow among tongues, it's even the most dangerous one. The reason I say it's the most dangerous one is that it still doesn't bear fruit. But the danger is that you waste your time nurturing it. You see, it will grow. Until the tongues will hold it, it will keep growing. But growing is different from bearing fruit. Because not every, every tree that grows bears fruit. So you can have your, your, your seed growing. And you see, you know, sometimes.
sometimes it's kind of interesting. As I speak, I know I'm going to talk about Saul. And I know somebody is going to say that. But even when God said that, he was still the king. You see, the truth of the matter is that he was still sitting on the throne, but God did not recognize him as king. Because God had said that this one is gone. And he has said that I have a new king. So you can sit on the throne. You see, you can see some money and you think that, oh yeah, God is blessing me and you can give testimonies. (laughs) Saul was still sitting on the throne. But God has departed long ago. Hallelujah. You might be seeing something, but where is it coming from? Hallelujah. (laughs) I want you to really understand God is God and he's careful to watch over his word. We need to understand that. Because many of us have gotten into the habit of staking the lottery in church. Let me try and see whether it will, it will yield something. So we keep trying and seeing and nothing is happening. And when we get to a certain point, we get fed up and we get offended. And we, because of that, some leave church. And I'm saying this because we have re- we go on evangelism every weekend. And I can say that a, Probably maybe 20, 30, or 40% of the people we meet are saying that when you go to church, people are only interested in your money. And they take your money, but you don't get anything back. The truth is that, did you read it in the Bible? Or someone was manipulating you? And that is why... I want you to really understand this so that, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. So that even if I, at any point, begin to manipulate you, quote the word of God back to me. You have to. And that is why I want you to know the word of God so that you can hold on to that word. And that word will help you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because if you don't know the word, you believe everything. And you throw common sense away. God has given us wisdom. We throw it away. And people are just doing stuff that are so dangerous. People go and steal money from their workplace to come and sow in church. Thinking that God is going to bless that. Where did you get that idea from? People are cheating on their friends so they can give. People are doing all kinds of corrupt things so they can give in church. So that God will bless them. Which God? Which God are you talking about? And it's all because our focus has shifted from what really matters. Holiness, righteousness. We have forgotten about that. What we, we are focused on now is how we can really be blessed. Amen. Amen. Blessed. From who? Blessing from who? Blessing from who? Are you saying that we don't have to give? Are, we, are you saying that we don't have to sow? I said, you can sow. We saw four different seeds sown, but 25% bore fruit. 75% didn't bear fruit. So it means that the principle of sowing and reaping is true. And God does not say we don't have to give. He does not say that. He really encourages us to do it. But to do it, the right way. Hallelujah. I know you have many questions. 
I know a lot of things are going through your mind. But I want you to settle in your spirit and just listen to what I'm saying because it's going to be a blessing for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Obedience must always precede sacrifice. Obeying the word of God must precede anything you offer to God. Because you see, if you don't obey God and if you don't live right for him and if you don't walk in his will, what you are giving might not be anything. Because it must be like, a, like a, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 1 says something that's kind of interesting. He says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifices of fools who do not know that they do wrong. You steal from people and you come and give that foolish sacrifice before the Lord and you don't even realize that what you are doing is wrong. Because you hear that when you give, because when you, when, when you were told that when you give, you will receive, you were not told that you have to give right. Do you know that God says that even when you come to church and you want to make an offering, or make a sacrifice and you stand before the altar and you remember that you have a problem with your brother, go resolve it. He did not say, go and throw the seed away. Go and throw the offering away. Go and throw the sacrifice away. He says that the, uh, it's okay to give the offering, but not at this time. Go and resolve the issue. Because if you don't, what you are going to give will not yield anything. It's unacceptable. And I, God, will not accept it. And if God is not accepting it, where is the fruit going to come from? So you can't just come and give. When you are giving, when anybody asks you to sow, when I ask you to sow a seed, when I ask you, which I don't normally do, I, I don't think I've ever done, but when I ask you to give, when I ask you to do something for the Lord, check with your life first. Whether what you are going to do is acceptable. Because the fact that I said it and you gave it doesn't mean God is going to bless it. I said the fact that I said it because I'm your pastor and I said it and you did it does not mean that God is going to do anything about it. I may not know you. I may not know that the money was stolen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know don't you know that the money was stolen? If the money is in your pocket, you know where you got it from. If it's a corrupt money, you know where you got it from. Hallelujah. So you have to really know that what I'm going to really give, so offer, whatever you want to call it, is it going to be acceptable to God? Where is it coming from? It's no wholesale. It's not because somebody said it, anything is going to happen. No. We ought to be careful. We've left the most important things. And we're following something else. I don't even know how to call it anymore. Hallelujah. And <laughs> Bible calls it the, 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 the sacrifice of fools. Who do not even know that they're doing wrong? Offering an unacceptable sacrifice before the Lord is wrong. Some people don't even have to give offering in church. They need to check their life first. They need to sort out their lives first. Hey, but the church is going to, hey, how is the church going to have money? God knows how to, you know, let me tell you something. Do you know that the church is for the Lord? And God is not broke? If God is not broke, his church cannot get broke. Hallelujah. Listen, if I have money in my pocket, I'm not broke. If you have money in your pocket, you are not broke. If God owns the church and God has everything, how can his church be broke? God's church does not depend on anybody here. It doesn't 
doesn't depend on you. You can choose not to give. God knows how to give to his church. Hallelujah. Change your mind. Someone was telling me, I mean, I think this week, one of, when we met, one was, one of, <laughs> one of our, I mean, the evangelism team, one person was saying that he spoke to someone and the person was saying that, uh, he was basically sharing the word of God and said, look, I go to church, but you people, you are making a mistake. Today's church is not about the Bible, Bible, Bible. It's about how good God is and how much he can put in your pocket. When did we get there? I thought that wasn't tr- the truth. But he said that's the truth. And other people confirm that, yes, we hear that all the time. You talk about Bible, Bible, Bible. Does the Bible feed? If I'm hungry, will I eat the Bible? Eat the word of God. By, what did Jesus say? Man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes. And be, Jesus said that, look, listen, evangelism is feeding yourself. Jesus said that I have food I eat that you do not know of. When he met that Samaritan woman and the disciples came back and they had food and they said, Jesus, why is he not? Does a woman cook for, for him? You see the evil mind they had about Jesus. How can he right now go to the woman's house for the woman to cook for for him to eat? But Jesus was busy sharing the word of God and did not have time for food. Bible says that, you know, Paul said it and that's the reality. Some people, their God is their stomach. So the church they are coming, it's all about how much they can eat. And because of that, when everybody say anything to them, they run after it. Because all that, their first priority is to fill their stomach. Their first priority is to be rich. When Bible says in Colossians that set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Hallelujah. You, you're this pastor, you don't want us to be rich. I want you to be rich. Hallelujah. But not the way you think. Hallelujah. Jesus said, (laughs) Some people, Paul says, some people, their God is their stomach. Jesus said, some people, their God is money. So not only should you be careful about food. Hallelujah. Be careful about money. Hallelujah. Yeah, but you see, the Bible says that. The Bible didn't say that money is bad. Yeah, okay. What did he say? Yeah, you know, the Bible said that, you see, uh, the love of is the root of all evil. Amen. Amen. That's scriptural. Yeah, I agree. But remember the other one too. In Matthew 6, 24. What does it say? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other. Or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and... Did you see love there? So money can be dangerous. Didn't... (laughs) Didn't Paul write to Timothy and said that some people eager for money like you? Or not, maybe not you. Maybe some other people. Because he said some people, so not you. You are good. Some people eager for money have done what? Wandered away from the truth. And they have done what? Pierced themselves with griefs. Some, they have wandered away. That is what, you see, People eager for money have wandered away from the truth. That's what the Bible says. That's why we meet people, evangelism team. That's why we all may, we always meet people and they say that we won't go to church again because people have taken. They were eager for money. They were so, so, so nothing happened. So now they have wandered away from the truth. They are home. They said they won't go to church again. 
That's the reality. Even you, you are planning to leave. Yeah, because if you sit in church and say, me, I have sold, I don't get anything. Are you not on your way out? Huh? Hallelujah. Don't go. Hallelujah. Beloved, it is always good for us to come to that place where we understand what God is saying and begin to follow through and do what God wants us to do. It's extremely important that as children of God, we become aware of the word and we begin to hold on to the word. Because it breaks my heart that many people are now branding the church as only interested in money. Which is not true. Unfortunately, because of what they see and what they hear on TV, on radio, and all kinds of places, all that they think they hear is to really give and God will give back to you. But again, Bible makes us understand that you cannot just give anyhow. You cannot just sacrifice anyhow. You cannot just sow anyhow. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Beloved, I want us to look at Samuel and Saul. There are two interesting encounters between these two that I want us to really pay attention to. And that's where we got to obey is better than sacrifice. Because the first encounter was in chapter, um, chapter 13. What happened was that Saul was the king. Samuel was a priest. Hallelujah. And Samuel had told uh, they were going to fight the Philistines. So Samuel had told him that you have to wait until I come and I make uh, a sacrifice. And then you, can, you have the freedom to go. And the king is not supposed to do, make the sacrifice. It's rather the priest. You see, again, I want you to understand that the issue is not, listen to me carefully, is not about the sacrifice alone but about who makes the sacrifice as well. So, it is not about you giving, but it's about who is giving. Are you, are you giving wickedly? Are you giving out of a place of faith and holiness? Or are you giving from a place of corruption? You, you know, so that's important. Because there were two people. One was king, one was priest. Everyone has his responsibility. And God is saying to us from this that, yes, we ought to give, but it is not everything that is accepting. Amen. Amen. So Saul was waiting for um, Samuel to come. And he did well. He waited for some time. Hallelujah. I said he did what? He waited for some time. Unfortunately, he was too long in coming. So he decided to go ahead and then give the sacrifice. Offer the sacrifice. So all, the Israel, all Israel had the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost. And now Israel had become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Let's be a little bit quick. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Aven. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. 
Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of God at Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, and again, he waited, what, seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. Seven days, but until 12 midnight, seven days is not over. So, you see, don't be hard pressed to look at what is around you and make decisions that have not been sanctioned by God. Many of us, we look at our situation. Yeah, it's the same thing. I mean, I'm waiting. I'm getting old. Where is the man coming from? Where is the woman coming from? It's taking too long. Let me marry anything that, has, that wears trousers. Hallelujah. Or skirts. It, because it's both ways. Hallelujah. But remember, some people are wearing skirts, but they are somebody else. <laughs> and some people are wearing trousers, but mm, anyway. You see, yes, a lot of the times we're hard-pressed because we're looking at the situation we find ourselves in. I'm married, but I'm not. You see, the, the babies are not coming. So somebody tells me, go to that man sitting by the corner there. He has some concussion. If you drink, you have a baby. And we begin to really follow all kinds of idols just because we want children. We look at the circumstance we are in to make decisions instead of holding on and waiting on the word of God. Hallelujah. So, seven days, wait for me. Some people, the, the, what breaks my heart is that some people wait and wait and wait and just at the time that the breakthrough is coming, they give up. So, Samuel was not coming, but the third time was seven days. So, Saul had waited and waited day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. People were running. I'm trusting God. I'm trusting God. On the seventh day, look, if it's not midnight yet, seven days are not finished. Hallelujah. You never know what God is going to do. And you have to wait. Don't go and take anything. Don't accept anything. Because the devil will bring... You see, out of desperation, we make a lot of choices that are not from God. Out of frustration, we make decisions that does not honor God. And we need to watch out. Wait. Waiting is difficult for the people in church. I've waited uh, since when? Saul waited and waited and waited and waited. On the seventh day, he said Samuel was not coming. So let's see what he did. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished, just as he finished, I said, just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out. Why is he going ahead of me? And Saul went out to greet him. Was it with a lifted head or bowed head? Greeted him how? Greeted him how? Couldn't you wait? And listen to to the conversation. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Samuel did not focus on the greeting. You know, some people will come and they will use some nice words to trick you. Samuel was not interested in that. Samuel went straight to the point. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering 
and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. What I thought, don't think for God. I said, don't think for God. I thought. Now, the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Don't feel compelled to do anything. Don't feel compelled to give because somebody is standing before you and telling you to give, 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 give. Don't feel compelled to give. Because if you feel compelled, he was, he felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You felt compelled to give. But was that the right thing to do? You felt compelled to give, so somebody's money is in your pocket, you gave. You felt compelled to give, so you went to steal and give, and, and, and give to God. I'm not too sure whether God received that. Hallelujah. Amen. You have done... When you give under compulsion, it's a foolish thing to do. When you have allow people to push you, force you, we've all done it before. I was foolish, now I'm wise. If you allow people to force you, to compel you, to give under compulsion, you have done a foolish thing. Don't look at your circumstance to give. Give because God Wants you to give. Hallelujah. So you have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Now, listen, listen. God is a gracious God. I said God is a gracious God. He did not say I have taken the throne from you. He said, if you have done the right thing, you have reigned for a long time. Hallelujah. Amen. That was the first offense. So God didn't take the throne. Not too long after that, because God did not take the throne, he reminded it. Hallelujah. You see, there are times we are doing some foolish thing, but we see some kind of little blessing here and there. And because of that, we think God approves it. He needs your obedience. That's what God is seeking for. Hallelujah. He did something wrong. And God made him understand that what you have done is wrong. And therefore, this is what is going to happen. He says, no, 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 go back. He said, if you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But because you didn't do the right thing, let's go to verse 14 now. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Hallelujah. Now, Let's go to chapter 15. I don't think we can read all. It's 1 to 26, but I don't. When you go home, you read it yourself. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. So someone said to Saul, I'm the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people, Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Hallelujah. Go on. Go on. Now go. Attack the Am This is the instruction. Go. Do what? And 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 totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women. 
children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telem. 200,000 full soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Now, he is going to do what God wants him to do. But the instruction was... I said the instructions was... All right. Let's go to verse 7. Because I can't, we, we can't read everything. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. <laughs> I said, he did what? He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with a sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle. The fat calves and lambs. Everything that was good. You see, sometimes what you see, listen, whether you see good or bad, it will have an influence on you. When you see bad, you can make a bad decision. When you see good, you can still make a bad decision. When he saw that the people were scattering, he made a bad decision. When he saw that there was some nice stuff around, he still made a bad decision. You see, we ought to look at the word of God. Don't look at the circumstance you are in. The circumstance you are in might be bad. But your desperation for money, your desperation for riches, your desperation for the things of the world will push you to make decisions that does not honor God. And you see, the point I'm trying to make is that we ought to learn to obey what God is saying. What is God saying or what has God said to us? God is saying that destroy them all. It's as simple as that. God is not hungry. I said God is not Psalm 50 verse 9. 8 and 9 actually. I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifice or concerning your burnt offering, which I have before me. Go on. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens. Why? Go, go on, go on. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were, I said, if I were, if I were, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. If God was hungry, he will not tell Saul to save the nice ones for him. Because he knows the nice ones, he created them. They are all for him. You see, if God wants to bless you, it's not about how much you can give to God. It's about how much you obey God. Because God is not in need of your money. I said God is not broke. <laughs> if this church is for the Lord, this church will never go broke. Unless we are not for him. He will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's what he does. Hallelujah. God knows how to give to his own. The psalmist said that he has never seen the righteous. He did not say any name, but he said the righteous. Listen, people quote this scripture. For themselves, but they are still broke. They are still begging for food. Because they are not righteous. I have never seen the righteous or their descendants begging for bread. Are you righteous? 
that turn the word of God around. We quote out of context and we pray, God, I remind you, this is your word. Whose word? The word that you are quoting. Are you living according to the word? And we deceive ourselves. That's why James 1.22 says it. He says, don't only do what? And do what? Deceive yourself. Do what it says. You can quote as much as you want. If you are not doing what God wants you to do, it's not getting anywhere. You can sow as much as you want. If you are not doing what God wants you to do, it's not getting anywhere. Hallelujah. I am here to tell you, you are nice people. And I'm here to let you understand, don't settle for the lie. If you want anything, begin to seek the face of God. Begin to walk with him. Because you do not know God, you believe every lie. He says obedience, we say sacrifice. Because that's what he's saying. Obedience is better than sacrifice. We, we don't even talk about obedience at all. We are talking about the sacrifice. So sacrifice, God will bless you. Sacrifice, God will bless you. Listen to me carefully. I want you to understand that I am not against you making an offering to the Lord. No, but I want you to be righteous first. I want you to please the Lord first. I want you to obey God first. I want you to walk in the will of God first. That is what is important. Hallelujah. Are you still with me? Okay, let's go to Samuel. Where were we? Where were we? But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle and fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These, they were unwilling to destroy completely. Look, you are a good man. You are a good woman. You are doing a lot. God sent them. I want you to listen to me carefully. I didn't send them. God said, go destroy the Amalekites. They went. They obeyed. Didn't they obey? So they went. When they got there, they did kill them. But in the destruction, God said totally, they began to segregate. They began to look at, if somebody sees a nice woman and says, this one I want to marry, I won't kill. If someone sees a nice goat, he says, no, I'll give this to God. You see, there are two. I'll give one to God and I'll take one. That's what they began to do. They were looking at what was, so what they saw was good. These, they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Because the Bible says that go, destroy totally. But then they decided to, be, to do partial obedience. God is not seeking your partial obedience. He's seeking your total obedience. So some people, yes, you gave. That's obedience. I agree. But did you obey totally? How about your life? Have you forgotten that he says that he does not, I mean, receive or he does not accept the sacrifices of the wicked? So if you are a wicked person, if you are not doing what you're supposed to do and you now come and give, it's not acceptable. And that's why you're always complaining. I have given a, begin to check your life first. Begin to search your heart first. Before you give. Hallelujah. All right. Go to the next verse. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king. Because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. God made you rich, but sometimes God will regret making you rich. And when God regrets making you rich, beloved, trouble begins to come. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. When he was enjoying and partying, 
Someone was crying before the Lord. Someone was crying before the Lord. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told Saul had gone to Camel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. Beloved in the Lord, I want us to really understand that there are many things we are doing that really pains God. And unfortunately, we will rather blame God. We do not look what we have done. We do not check our own lives when we begin to blame God. Hallelujah. Okay, verse 14. Actually, verse 13. When Samuel reached him, when he got to Saul, Saul said, you know, he's always fond of speaking first. When he saw Samuel the first time in chapter 13, the Bible says that he went to greet him. This time, when he, Samuel read him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, Listen. God sees everything. Amen. When at 12 midnight you were praying in somebody's room, you went to the living room. God knows the, bed, the bedroom, what's going on there. So it's not the, the sacrifice of your prayer that is going to do anything. God is looking at the other side. When he thought he was really trying to mess up with Samuel, God could, you know, I love God. Do you love God? Yes. Okay. God did not do anything to Samuel, uh, to Saul. He did not say, you know, Samuel is a gentleman. So, go to 13. When Samuel read him, as, yeah, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is the bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Yes, you are killing your enemy, but who is snoring behind? Yes, you are giving the money to me. But where is it coming from? Uh, Hallelujah. Uh, you see, God is not saying anything. He is asking a question. Hallelujah. Uh, what then? You did everything. Look, I wasn't there. So I don't know where this money came from. I wasn't there. So I don't know how you managed to get pregnant. I wasn't there. So I don't even know. You came, you said you are married. Fine, but I don't know where that man or that woman is coming from. Did you obey God? Yes, you came to me. <laughs> Come, the two of you, come. I'm the pastor. <laughs> he came. Look at his coat. <laughs> pastor, you see, I've seen this woman and I want to marry. Okay, fine. Then I will ask and then we will talk and then, uh, then uh, we will get to certain places because you, you, you don't have to sleep with her before you marry her. So I will ask, uh, oh, yeah, Pastor, we have not done anything. Ah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. As for me, 
I may not know. I may not know. I said I may not know. But what is the bleating that I hear? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. You can say anything to a man. You can say anything to Samuel, but not to God. Yeah. I said you can say anything. You can bring the money and give it to the pastor. You can do whatever you want to do. He will tell you the truth. But if you still want to really steal and give, you may not receive anything. Because God can hear the bleating. God knows where it's coming from. You may lie about it. But God knows the truth. God knows the truth. I said God knows the truth. Obedience is better. To obey God and his commands is better than giving everything to him. Like your, your money. I offer this, I offer this, I offer this. Please. He owns everything. He owns everything. Verse 15. You can see that. Samuel, uh, Saul answered, Oh, that's Samuel Pa. <laughs> ah, is, is this that you are worried? God loves sacrifices, so God, He likes sacrifices, and He always. You see, God said, you know, the Bible says that you go and give uh, a maimed animal to your governor and see whether he will accept it. So God wants the nice ones. Hallelujah. So someone, a soul answered. The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. As for, it's on me, oh, it's the soldiers. <laughs> they spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Your, you, you, your God, your God. Hallelujah. Pastor, it's for your God. Pastor, as for this one, look, I have emptied my accounts for your God. Then we'll give you special blessing. No, be like Samuel. Don't bless my heart. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> no, go back. <laughs> okay. The soldiers brought them from the Amalekite. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Totally. What is the word totally? Total means total. Total means what? You don't select some and say, still say total. Hallelujah. And then, go to the next verse. Enough. Enough. Someone was just, because he was getting angry. Remember that he got angry before he came. So it was getting out of hand. He said, enough. Look, we try to really talk nice to the pastors. We try to talk nice. Then we will say, oh, you see, pastor, you see, uh, as for the building, I will roof it. As for this, I will do this. I will do this. Where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? That's what we need to tell the church. That's what we need to encourage the church. Hallelujah. Enough, someone said to Saul, let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. No, that's what we do. Don't be surprised. That's what we do. We defend the, the things we don't have to defend. We have every reason why we did the wrong we did. 
We have every reason we, we stole. We have every reason we did this. Now today, the, the, the church has reasons to do what, you know, and we don't even align it with the word of God. God gave his word. He, is, he has chosen to do what pleases him. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag the Achim. What's that the instruction of God? The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God, at Gilgal. But Samuel replied that the Lord delights in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fact of rams. If you will give to the Lord, if you will sow a seed, whatever you will do to, for the Lord, make sure that it comes from a place of obedience. Make sure that you are obeying God in your life. Make sure you hear the instructions from the Lord. Don't do it out of compulsion. Don't do it because you feel like Saul felt. You feel God wants it. God doesn't want your feeling. He wants your obedience. He wants you to obey him. He doesn't want you to really disobey him and tell him that you feel. You feel what? What do you feel? It's not about your feelings. It's about the word of God. How do you see the word? And how do you obey the word? I am troubled in my spirit because he says obedience is better than offering sacrifices. But we don't even talk about the obedience anymore. It doesn't matter where you slept last night. It doesn't matter how you got the money. It doesn't matter how you live in your life. So, you, you, God will bless you. That's what worries me. That's what troubles me. And that's why I'm speaking to you. Because once God began to do this in my spirit, he asked me to talk to you. Because many of us are in, in church but we are discouraged because somebody is giving a testimony and they gave less than what we gave. But they have a testimony. But we still don't have a testimony. We're still not seeing anything. We're still complaining because we're giving everything. We are asked to empty our bank accounts and bring. We do, but we still see nothing. And we are complaining. One thing I will say is that empty your heart and give it to God. Because the Bible says, listen to me carefully. Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things that you want, that I want, shall be given to us. What he's seeking is how we obey him. As for, because if God has not given it to you to sow, he did not ask you to go and steal. He knows he's not giving to you. Your obedience can open a door that has been shut in your face for so many years. What you need is to begin to obey God. What you need. I said, listen to me. Stop giving carelessly to God. Give wisely. I said give wisely. Because it's not because you are giving something God is going to be compelled to give you something. God is seeking that you obey him, that you walk faithfully before him, that you walk in righteousness. God, you see, God knows your heart before you gave. God is always with us. He knows what we do. He knows how we live our lives. So he says that even when you are standing before the altar and he reminds you of anything, go back and resolve it before you come and give. Else you give carelessly. You will give an offering that does not bring any blessing. Many of us are doing that. And because we are not seeing the blessing, 
we are complaining and blaming God and the church. Beloved in the Lord, let no one deceive you. Let no one trick you. Let no one compel you. Give generously to the Lord as God directs you. Don't wait until someone stands before you and compels you and pushes you to give. Don't. Open your heart to him. If God blessed you, you know who blessed you and it's easy for you to give back to his work. I want you to understand that this morning, God is asking you that from today, don't give the sacrifice of a fool. Don't give carelessly an offering that does not please the Lord. Don't sow a seed that is not going to yield anything. Be careful and wait before the Lord. Seek to walk in faithfulness before him. That is what pleases him, not your money. Because he says that everything is his. The silver and gold are the Lord's. He knows you. He knows where that money is coming from. And therefore, if you give without obeying, there is no blessing. I don't want you to go in a direction that will not honor God. I want you to walk from this day in obedience to God. Walk in holiness. Walk in righteousness. Let's begin to do the first things first. To learn to obey him. To learn to live right for him. And then we can do the other things. And we will see the blessing of God in our lives. God bless you.